second week of our How We Grow series, and we're talking about growing spiritually. Remember last week I, I talked growing spiritually was about allowing us to help to bridge that gap between the perfect kingdom in heaven where God's reign is, is perfected and this kingdom here on earth where we all kind of, we know something's wrong. We might not know what, but we know that this isn't 100% what it's meant to be. So how do we make it just a little bit better? Growing spiritually is learning how to do it, and then, of course, actually doing it as well. And last week we talked about guarding our time and how important it was to help us grow spiritually in just guarding our time and setting aside time to disconnect and to be at rest. And in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about slowing down, which is probably really necessary before we go into the Advent season and things are just going to pick up. We're going to talk about the importance of journaling, which doesn't always strike people as a distinctly spiritual practice, but it is. And we'll also talk about participating in a community of faith and how that helps us to grow spiritually. But this week, we're going to talk about giving up the things that hold us back. We're going to talk about giving. Now to the people that Jesus was preaching to, the people that Paul was preaching to, giving up was, by and large, a difficult thing. They had this very subsistence-level living. They didn't have a change of sandals. They had one sandal, and when they developed a hole in that one sandal, which was barely more than a piece of leather wrapped around their foot, they would just think, okay, how much longer can I go before I have to get a new piece of leather to wrap around my foot? They might have a second tunic and set of clothes to wear. Might. They definitely wouldn't have a spare cloak to help stay warm at night. You only needed one belt. I mean, you were only going to wear one tunic at a time. All of these extravagances of extras, uh, a house with more than one room. I mean, your house usually had four walls. That was just to keep everything out. You didn't have a separate kitchen and living room and bedrooms. It was a very, very bare-bones, subsistence level. Pretty much everything that you took home from work, that went towards your daily living. It was very easy to, to want to hoard things because, again, as I mentioned last week, some days you got a lot and some days you might not get as much. So you'd want to kind of hoard up a little extra food. Maybe if you could afford it, you might want to get that second pair of sandals before you really, really, really needed them. And of course, if you've got two, well, maybe you need a third. Or if you've got two sets of clothing, maybe, maybe you need a third and a fourth, and oh, let, let's have a, a special set that we we'll bring out for the special occasion so we look like we're important. It was easy to start to hoard things. In the midst of this, Jesus comes in, and in the Sermon on the Mount, that first sermon that he preaches in Matthew, he talks about don't hoard treasures. Don't store things up on earth. Instead, you want to build up treasures in heaven, which I'm sure to a lot of people literally sounded like pie-in-the-sky thinking. I mean, you've got to have spares, we've got to have extras, we can't just survive on one. We need to save up for a, a rainy day or for a dry spell when we don't have a whole lot coming in. And yet Jesus was saying all of this, don't store up the treasures on earth. And it was very difficult for many of his followers, who would have been lower class people, to understand this or to think about this. Paul writes to the Philippians, and when Paul 
is writing this letter, he's in jail already. He doesn't have a whole lot. And yet he talks about how he's got enough. He doesn't need anything. He's learned how to be content with whether he has a lot of things. And certainly in his previous life as Saul of Tarsus, he would have had a lot of things. Or whether he has very few things, which this new Paul, the evangelist, preaching the good news, he certainly wouldn't have had much. And he says he's satisfied with whatever he has, whether it's much or whether it's little. Whether he has a full stomach or whether he has an empty stomach, he's learned to be content. For him, his measure of fulfillment doesn't come from all of the extra stuff that he's got on earth, but it comes from that spiritual treasure, that spiritual nourishment that he's getting from God. That's where he gets his fulfillment from. God is the source of our good treasures, of our feeling of fulfillment. Now, to be clear, this is not a repudiation of physical needs. We all have physical needs. This isn't saying that we all have to give up a life of any sort of income and take a vow of poverty. That isn't what Jesus or Paul or anyone is saying here. But what they're saying is don't store up, don't overvalue the treasures that you have here on earth. In a way, they're kind of saying, maybe a few centuries before it became popular, you can't take it with you. So choose where you're going to invest. Choose where you're going to put your efforts into building up treasure. Is it going to be in your bank account? Or is it going to be in those heavenly treasures? Those values that God loves, values of justice, mercy, humility, faith, hope, love, is that where you're going to invest? In these heavenly treasures that the moths can't take away. The moths can't eat, the rust isn't going to destroy your love, thieves can't steal your faith. I mean, you may choose to give it up, but they can't take it. It's kind of what Eric Fromm would have referred to as modal confusion. See, Eric Fromm talked about how we have different relationships with different things. Sometimes we have an I-it relationship, like the relationship that I might have with my computer. It's something that I own. And then there's an I-thou relationship, a relationship that I have with another person, like with Angela or Jacob or with any of you. And to say that I own any of you, well, I'm glad you it's not there for And I'm glad Angela's not here for that. Because I don't own them. They aren't things that I can possess. They aren't things that I can just exchange. If my computer breaks down, I can get a new computer. No problem. Angela breaks down. I can't get a new Angela. I can't replace Angela. And the problem is, is that sometimes we get this I-thou relationship with the physical things, and we get an I-it relationship with people. We have an I-it relationship where we think people are exchangeable, or we act that way, and we have an I-thou relationship with physical possessions that cannot be replaced. We need more and more. Eric Fromm calls that modal confusion. And what Jesus is trying to do here is switch it back to the way it's supposed to be. That yes, you have things, but those things can be replaced. The people, the relationships, what you value, that's what's important. That's what you put your time into building up, into really investing in. I've led enough funerals, and what I've noticed is at the eulogies, I, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone remembered for having many cars. And if they're remembered for having a big, beautiful house, it's not so much the house that they're remembered for, it's the 
beautiful things that happened in that house. It's the wonderful times that were shared. It's the fact that you could go up to that house, knock on the door, and someone would welcome you in. The fact that that house always smelled of fresh baked cookies. Those are the things that people are remembered for. Those are the things that we should invest in. But again, we're not, we're not saying that worldly wealth is, is something that we shouldn't have. It's just not something we should center on. We shouldn't get too attached to the earthly treasures that we have here, but value the spiritual treasures. Now, when I started my call here at Emmanuel, I had a few hobbies. Uh, one of them was collecting and painting little tabletop miniatures. Uh, some of the models would be about yay high, some of them were, were rather large. And I would collect them, and I had great designs on having these beautiful display cabinets full of painted models, and oh, it would look so good. And even if you weren't really into it, you would at least come by and go, wow, that's a really nice model there, Tom. That's a great paint job. But then, you know, life changes, and I have a young one who enters. As, as any parent would tell you, time seems to just evaporate. And yet these, these little miniatures, many of which come in, in gray, they all stayed gray on my bookshelves, or on top of the mantle, or on my desk, or really any other flat surface that I could put them where Angela wouldn't growl them too much. And yet I always had these 50 shelves of gray, as some people call them. These gray models that I never get around to painting. And I realized that. And I would look at them and I would just get so dejected and so broken hearted and just, oh, I just need some time to work on that. I've got this and I've got that. And I've got that. Oh, Jacob's calling. And so one day, not too long ago, I made this decision. If I'm not going to paint them, get rid of them. And so in the course of about a weekend, I got rid of not only the models, I got rid of a drawer full of paint that I was using to paint these models, 20 different shades of blue. I, I got rid of most of the brushes. I got rid of a lot of stuff that I knew I just, I was never going to get around to painting this. I was never going to get around to, to using this at all. And all I was doing was just taking up space, not only on my shelves, but also in my life as I tried to carry on and, and fool myself into thinking that I was actually participating in this hobby. Now, there were some pieces that I was really proud of, and I kept those. But I got rid of all the ones that I didn't need. I didn't want those earthly treasures holding me back. But I also thought to myself, you know, if the day ever comes, where Jacob says, hey, Danny, that, that big model up there, I, I want one of those. I want to put one of those together. I want to paint one of those. Is there a game that goes with them? Can we play that game? I'm thinking, wouldn't that be a wonderful father-son bonding experience? You know, a little shared hobby that we might have when the time's right. You can use those earthly treasures to invest in the spiritual treasures. But then, if the day comes after that, where he says, Daddy, only kids play with that, I don't play with that anymore, I'm not a kid. Alright, it's over. Using those earthly treasures to invest in the spiritual treasures, but once it's not working anymore, you go on. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do with the earthly treasures. That's what Paul is saying to do. That it's the spiritual treasures that will give you fulfillment. The earthly treasures are used to help build that. But they are a means to an end. They're never the end. And so in the same way, we should go out and we should think about those things, those earthly treasures, whether they're physical things, whether they're habitual things, whether they're commitments on your calendar, and just think of, do you need to be freed from this so that you can invest in those spiritual treasures? in those heavenly treasures, so that you can help to bring just a, a glimmer of the kingdom of heaven here 
on earth. Because earthly treasures rust. Spiritual treasures, they last. And we, as followers of Jesus, need to choose where we're going to invest our time. Let me pray for you. God of abundance and growth, we know that we are oftentimes tied down with earthly treasures, whether they're physical things, whether they're activities, and it just keeps us from you. But we give thanks for Jesus, who shows us how to be free. We give thanks for apostles and prophets who also show us how to be free, what it's like to live with you. And we ask God that all of our earthly treasures can be just a means to an end of building up heavenly treasures so that we can grow spiritually, so that we can bring the light of heaven into the world here. We ask all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.